Hey everyone, I'm Raif Darazi, and in this video, I'm excited to bring back our very special guest, Mark S. King, whom we sat down and chatted with earlier in the year, but this time we'll be discussing his new book, officially released today. The book is titled My Fabulous Disease, Chronicles of a Gay Survivor. About Mark's book, Sean Stroop, author of Body Counts, said, if the AIDS pandemic had a Mark Twain, it would be Mark S. King. And Peter Staley, prominent activist, and author of Never Silent, Act Up, and My Life in Activism said, start with queer attitude, add a spoonful of humor, camp and or dark, and top it all off with a heart of gold, and you'll still be missing some secret ingredients found in my fabulous disease. Mark's writing is a diary of survival and a beautiful example of giving back. I know his words have helped me over the years, and he has my thanks. Bon appetit! My Fabulous Disease is also the name of Mark's award-winning blog, which I highly recommend signing up for so you can receive those posts via email. Just visit www.marksking.com, and I'll have that link below in the description box as well. To recap, Mark S. King is an award-winning blogger, author, speaker, and HIV-AIDS activist who has been involved in HIV causes since testing positive during my birth year, 1985. And he's won numerous awards for his work. If you haven't seen our previous interview in which we got to know him and his story, living through the early days of the AIDS epidemic, talking about addiction and aging with HIV, I'll put up a card here so you can watch that as well. Mark, welcome back. So happy to have you. Thank you very much, Rafe. It is so great to be here and see you again. How are you? I'm doing wonderfully. And um, I see that you are in your very beautiful new home. Congrats. Thank you. We moved. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, um, and I so... can pick up the computer and give you a tour all around if you want. <laughs> I have a great bathroom if you want to see it. We'll have to reschedule for that one because okay. I really want to get to your book. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, well, okay. Will you tell me, let's start off by going into what inspired you to put this book together. You know, the same thing that's always inspired me, I guess, and that is just to tell the story, right? Of uh, those of us living with HIV or all of the aspects of ourselves, because I, I never want to reduce us to just that, of course, our diagnosis, or even the fact that I made it out of the 80s alive. I, I, I want to make sure that we cover all aspects. And so there's like, there's five big sections of the book, and only one is specifically devoted to HIV. The rest is about, well, addiction, <laughs> but family and love and sex and uh, a lot of sex in the book, I got to tell you. And so, yeah, it's uh, what's inspired me is to tell the truth and um, have some fun along the way. Do it in an entertaining way. And was this a goal that you've always had in mind, putting a book together, or did this kind of just come organically it, later on? You know, um, I am certainly an immediate gratification in terms of what's been great about the blog is when I write something, I don't have to wait for an editor and for uh, a, a publishing house, and then a year later, you get to read it. I, I just press a button. But it's also true that over the years, and this and the book represents four decades of writing. Over the years, there's been some pieces that are really near and dear to me. Um, some of them are very funny. And uh, I, I didn't want you to have to scrounge through 40 years of my blog to find them. And so uh, I have uh, collected them from my site and from magazines, The Advocate, Pause Magazine, others, other websites um, that uh, I have contributed to and put them all very conveniently for you between two covers. Amazing. And I'm so glad you did that. I absolutely cannot stress how much I love Mark's book and everything that he, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that right now. Okay. So I want to start with, I'm going to start with some excerpts because I took a bunch of notes. Oh. I hope you don't mind me revealing just little snippets here oh, and there. No. That I wanna uh, by like. all means, reveal. I'm an open okay. book. And, and, and to Mark's credit, I haven't given him any of the talking points. So he has no idea what I'm going to be talking about here. Okay. You said there was a time when old friends called to say goodbye. And by goodbye, they meant forever, when all of us had a file folder marked memorial that outlined how we wanted our service to be conducted, when people shot themselves or jumped off bridges after getting their test results. Yeah. Whew, it's very clear from the beginning of your book that we're going to, re what we're about to embark on, what we're going to read will be brutally honest. Yeah. And it's a bit shocking. And also, and also in a way, like an invitation to to really understand in a 
different way that time and in a way that we often don't really get insight to. You know, I thank you for that. I, I, I want, I feel like a lot of people know the statistics. So they know intellectually what happened. Oh, there's this thing that happened and it caught us all by surprise. And a lot of people died and it was really bad. I want people to know how it felt. And um, when I, that quote there, you know, it is, is completely true. I would get calls at night and the phone would ring. And if the phone rang after 11, someone was dead. It's funny because that sounds like, you know, I don't know, some anxious mother, grandmother's story kind of story. And that's the irony of it because that's who we were at that time. We were elderly. I, we, we, in other words, we had as much death commonly as would your grandmother and, and her friends you know um and then the memorial thing is also true i had my you know it's funny i haven't updated it in a while which shows you the fact that things have gotten better but i would keep it updated and thank god that i'm still alive because i have so much more content for my memorial in terms of video i might show a clip of this who knows we'll see how it goes we'll see if <laughs> how you rank uh and you know, uh, uh, video clips of me through the years doing crazy things. And um, I haven't updated it in a while. I have a feeling that it's going to stay tucked away for a while longer. Well, good. I hope so. I also noticed very early on that there is a constant tension between the immediacy of what was happening in the 80s and how important, traumatic, devastating it was, contrasting with the present moment and life kind of just continuing on. Life is indifferent and it just moves forward. Um, you, you, you mentioned regarding the term long-term survivor. I ha quote, I have misgivings about that unsettling designation because it doesn't speak to my other parallel life experiences and it suggests a dismissal of my relevance in the here and now. I mean, I, I, um, that's true. I, it, you know, it's funny. On the one hand, I've got HIV tattooed on my forehead, man, because it is what I do. And so it is the first thing people know me for. And I'm OK with that. Or I've made my peace with that because it's kind of my vocation. And and uh, that's all right. I guess what I'm saying there is just reducing me to that doesn't take into account all the other episodes that you're going to read about in the book uh, about, you know, sexual misadventures <laughs> and um uh, falling in love and uh, my family dealing with a very kind of outrageous gay son, all of that stuff. I don't, th I think I'm doing myself and all long-term survivors a disservice if I am only talking about that. And I don't paint us with a broad brush in terms of all of our other life experiences. You know, um, I've, there's, I've gone through a lot of shit, right? You know, it has nothing to do with HIV. Yes, I agree. And, and you bring up a really good point because I've had people actually say directly to me in the, in the past when I kind of showed that my content was focused heavily on living with HIV. And they're like, well, you don't want to be pigeonholed as someone who is the HIV guy. Um, and there's so much more to that. And I've kind of, I've wrestled with that a little bit and gone back and forth because I think, yes, I am. I am so much more than that. And I have so much more to offer and give. But in the same vein, I'm also like, this is I'm kind of being called in this way. And so what if people see me as that person? You know, um, it's an immutable characteristic about us. And uh, it's 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 uh, it's a character trait as much as my being a redhead um, or you uh, being uh, what is that brunette, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> or the fact that there are other aspects of you. You are a natural bodybuilder. I am uh not but uh <laughs> the the point is there's so there's a lot more you're right and you know there are worse things i guess in other words they can they, if people need a shorthand and they go oh mark he's that funny guy with hiv you know that's fair it's fair that's okay and and i don't feel any stigma from that you know if they if they want to reduce me to that's my elevator pitch you know, well, I, I write these funny nostalgic pieces, uh, much, many of which are about living with HIV. That's fair. That's pretty much, you got it, you know? Um, in other words, I'm not going to soak in any of any stigma as a result of that. 
um, you know, and what, what the famous quote about no one can make you feel badly about yourself without your permission. Yeah. And, and you hit, I think you hit the nail on the head by mentioning stigma, because I think that is subconsciously what is driving people to say that, because when we hear about an economist or a prolific historian or something, we don't go, oh, you don't want to be the guy that's known as an economist. Like you're so much more than that, right? It's like, this is the same thing. Like, right. why is this different? And we are both in arenas. Uh, we are both in this particular arena in which we are excelling. Uh, and by that, I mean, we are in kind of a media landscape where we ha aren't afraid to put HIV forward. And, um, uh, and we're doing it successfully and uh, with meaning and intention. And uh, that's great. Good for us. Okay. Uh, in another essay entitled Once When We Were Heroes, um, and for those of you who actually, let's, let's take a step back. So this book is a collection of essays over 40 years, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And so, and I thought I, I was surprised because I didn't realize that that was the structure of the book. And I thought this is so great because you can sit down and curl up into bed at night and read an essay and then have so much to to kind of soak in and think about and it's and it's over it's like i always say i like to do what i do in about 800 words i want to tell you a story and make a point and goodbye you know so it's perfect reading for anyone who doesn't have a long attention span you know or um like you say you're, you're you want to you want to uh have a little read uh at night Wh whatever the circumstances are uh it is um they're bite-sized they're easily digestible, but within them, there's going to be some stuff. And what I like about it, about the structure of it, is when you turn the page to the next one, you have no idea what you're going to get. It may be something sweet and nostalgic. It may be scary. It may be um, very funny. Uh, it's There's no telling, and you'll have to turn the page and find out. Okay, so back to this essay entitled Once When We Were Heroes. Um, you speak to the bravery that existed during the early days of the, the epidemic and how bravery in your experience does exist today, but nothing like it did then. And how, quote, you said, your most courageous self, the best man you'll ever be, lived more than two decades ago during the first years of a horrific plague. It, it sounds like it gave you an incredible sense of purpose, all that tragedy having to survive moment by moment and help others survive and, and sometimes pass away in with dignity, some sense of dignity, um, one moment to the next and it, how it grounded you in the present like nothing else. Almost like what you would hear from someone who had survived a, a war. Mm -hmm. um, I love the honesty of admitting that something so horrific also gave you a visceral sense of purpose and made you feel like, in your words, a hero. Um, I don't think that's an easy thing to admit. None of us wants to admit we gain some sense of self-satisfaction or meaning from a tragedy. It's not politically correct. There's an expectation that we would only view that time as something very negative. Mm -hmm. But what you're describing is something I think is very human and very real. Can you speak to that a bit? Um, for, I, I think heroism is what you do when you have no other choice. Uh, and uh, often, uh, I don't think people just say, I'm going to go be a hero. And, you know, I, I don't think it's premeditated. I think it's circumstantial. I, you know, pulled the lady out of the burning car because I was there. I had to, you know. And um, I feel as if, yes, the best man I will ever be existed during those horrific years. When I stepped up, when I faced the things that terrified me most, death, dying, disfigurement, all of these things that came along with AIDS um, because of our response to it. The most you can ask about life and your own behavior is how you respond to things. It's not like, oh, this terrible thing that happened to me. It's how did I respond to this thing that happened? And, um, you know, I, I, I think that we behaved, we responded heroically and uh, with incredible compassion for one another. And uh, especially when the odds were kind of stacked against us and a lot of people didn't care and a lot of people wanted to do, you know, be done with us. And uh, 
quarantine us and not deliver meals into our hospital rooms and all of these terrible things. I, um, despite all of that, we behaved admirably and did great work. I will say this though, tragedy is not a contest and younger people today are going to have their stuff, whatever it is, they're going to have their stuff. I have absolute faith in, in whatever that is for you, Rafe, for the next generation. Uh, they're going to respond wonderfully because I've seen the very best of human spirit. I've seen the very best of humanity and we stepped up and we did it. And that tells me that you can do it too. This is not all about weren't we great? It's wow, humanity. Humanity, look what we're capable of, you know, when our backs are against the wall. It gave me faith in humanity. And that's shared with all of us. And again, we had no other choice. And it was a situation where we were called up. We were called to do it, right? And um, there will be other things. There will be more situations. For that matter, I think that this is a very dangerous time we live in right now, socially, politically, et cetera. It's very dangerous and it's gonna take a lot of that sort of courage. It's gonna take a lot of people standing up going, whoa, I draw the line here, you know, um, and we're seeing a lot of it. We are seeing uh, a renewed uh, uh, excitement and strength among women over the, having agency over their own bodies. We are seeing enormous uh, new energy amongst young people about climate change and about the world that is being handed to them, and they're not thrilled. There are many, many challenges ahead. At the end of the day, I have faith in people. Uh, I think it's rough. I think these times are rough. Uh, and, and maybe it's harder today because the enemy, as it were, the thing we're fighting, maybe it isn't as, it doesn't feel as, I think you used the word immediate. In the 80s, it was immediate. There's my best friend. There he is in bed dying. That's immediate. I can see that. It makes me angry. I want to go do something about it. You know, things like climate change. Well, you know, the latest, you know, brush fire that kills people or the latest, you know, megastorm, maybe that's immediate enough for people to rise up. I think that we're seeing that. And like you said, it come, it's born out of necessity. Yes. Yes. And so yeah, that's the flip side of really that, isn't that, Rafe? And that is, yes, her heroism is when you have no other choice, meaning... It's only until we absolutely have to <laughs> that we say, okay, enough. You know, when yeah. is that point? It's a bit human nature. And that's what will hopefully drive us to rediscover our humanity. Because I think that's been lost along the way. There's so much cynicism. There is. You know, um, okay, I'll get, can I get a little political and say this? Back in the day, in the early 80s, when we were facing AIDS and all of that, there was a lot of ignorance and stigma and homophobia and all of those things um, about gay men who were getting bearing the brunt of this uh, new disease. And I give the people there a little slack, the people there that were showing such ignorance because they were truly ignorant. There, you know, there weren't a lot of people out in the early 80s. We didn't have shows on TV. We didn't have movies that were showing positive, you know, characterization of, of LGBTQ people, okay? So there was a lot of education to do just so they would see us as worthy human beings. What's happening today is willful ignorance about who we are. What's happening today is so much more devious than, than then because when people are discriminating against us, uh, when they are uh, throwing hatred our way, it used to be out of ignorance and fear. Now it's out of political expediency and just this devious hatred uh, because of being, a, I think it's still driven by fear. Oh, you're going to take away something from, my, from me that I have. That I don't want to share it, whatever that is. Rights. Who knows? Whatever it is. And uh, so I think, I think this landscape is, is more dangerous than the landscape I came of age in during AIDS. It puts it in perspective and it, and it makes me so happy that like every third essay in my book is funny <laughs> because we go there. I go there in terms of those dark, uh, you know, the dark years of the epidemic and 
helping you understand how it felt. But then I want to give you a break. I want to, I want, let's, okay, let's laugh because I got this hilarious story about shopping for socks in the mall with Larry Kramer, the great AIDS activist, or um, all the times I used to be in the health clinic uh, when I was a tot in West Hollywood before um, HIV came along. And we were all just having a great time, you know, getting busy on the weekends. And then, you know, come Thursday, we would have to visit the clinic. I used to say I got the clap so many times I called it the applause. Well, and isn't that life? I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. It's all not one note either. It's very, you're, you're a three-dimensional human being. And I think that you express that very, very well. Yeah. Okay. I just want to, before we move on, I do have another follow-up question. And that is when you say that you're, you're the best man you'll, you'll ever be lived more than two, two decades ago, what does that leave moving forward? Because I think that this is a very relevant question, not just to people who survived the um, AIDS epidemic, but anyone who is professional athletes, people who have like risen to the occasion, risen in it during a tragedy at some point in their life, and then have to live, go about living the rest of their life. How do you make peace with that? And how do you find purpose moving forward? Well, you know, I, I, I don't feel as if, okay, I did it and now my life is over and I'm going to coast my way through the rest. In other words, first of all, something else may come along and does. I, I participate in other cause-related things. I think all of us are on a search of, for meaning. We're all trying to figure out what does this all mean? Why are we here? What are we doing? And for me, it's simple. I, we're here to help somebody else. It's simple as that. Help, help make the road a little simpler for the next person. As corny as that is, it's the truth. So I did that during AIDS in this big dramatic way, you know, uh, holding friends' uh, hands while they died. I mean, that's a pretty, okay, so that's high drama. It doesn't mean that I don't continue to kind of what meaning is or my search doesn't evolve as we go along. Okay, yes, I did that. Yes, it may be like the most high drama thing that ever happened to me. But there are simple things day to day. I have friends now that need help for w whatever reason. I have, you know, I, I have friends dealing with addiction and recovery, which I know something about. I am able to help them through that. There might be some, but there may be a neighbor or a sister or somebody for whom you are going to help. And that's it. That's is that, that's, you know, we, we all don't get these front page stories of our die-ins back in the day. You know, uh, it doesn't mean our lives aren't worthy and that our, our, our capacity to help other people isn't there and isn't useful. I think that really um, crystallized that notion really well in my head because it makes me think of even just something we can all relate to is just getting older and how when you mentioned the drama, that instantly makes me think of like, teenage years or early 20s life is so passionate and intense and relationships are so like at max level and then as you get older you realize oh okay like life is experienced not as intensely in a very different way and it's it there's it's just as special and it's in a different way well because when you're younger like you rave when you're younger <laughs> yeah right um, there's still so many life experiences that you're having for the first time. And so your response to it is very heightened and it's exciting or it's horrible or it's whatever it is. And um, as you age, yeah, it's true that with maturity, it's kind of like, you've kind of seen it all. <laughs> you know, you've, you are, you've experienced, whatever that is, you've experienced it before. You remember that it turned out okay. It's funny, I, I used to get all caught up in righteous indignation, my favorite emotion act up, fight back. You know, that was such a great example of righteous indignation. I was young and had a lot of energy and it was great. And I invested all of that emotion into that. Today, I am more, I have more of a budget of how much of that righteous indignation um, that I'm willing to, to expel. And it's not that it doesn't, that people out there don't need it. I treat it more economically these days. It takes a lot to get me riled up. And it's not that I don't care. It's that I'm older. I've got so much energy. I'm not going to wear myself out. I'm going to be here as a resource for those who are younger and are willing to go out there and do it. And it's also true that in my recovery process from addiction, 
I have to be careful about becoming unsettled, about becoming angry and uh, discontent. It makes me want to change the way I feel. And I have some real great shortcuts for doing that. So I have to be, I have to be careful. And the attitude I've developed is, okay, there's that thing over there and it's a real outrage and there's other people over there and they appear to be handling it. I think it's going to be fine. They don't need me. They'll let me know if they do. I will finish uh, watching my Netflix movie. And that's not a cop out. That's me just showing, you know, budgeting what it is I can afford um, to take on. And jumping into another essay, Surviving Life Itself, uh, mm-hmm. you talked about overhearing a woman on the bus who knew someone who died, and she was having this kind of quiet conversation with someone next to her. And, and, I, was, and, and I, was, I was completely um, listening in. And your thought, your response was, quote, just one? You know just one person who died? Question mark. And I, again, it reminds me of what I imagine those that come from war or other major tragedies must have felt that perspective. Most of us today could never truly understand. I told you earlier, tragedy isn't a contest. And now here I am contradicting myself because I was kind of putting my life, comparing, comparing my life experience to hers. She was on the well, bus. I'm going to interrupt you before you, before you explain, I want to say that these contradictions are what make us human. Both these, these contradictions can exist in the same person. And most people they narrate that out. They, 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 they make it one thing, but it's, we have these contradictions. So thank you for doing it. Okay. Continue. You're absolutely right. She was having this conversation that I was eavesdropping on and she was saying, Oh, I have this friend that died and it was really bad. And um, she, or she started by saying, Oh, I know somebody who died. Like, like one person, I know someone who died. It was a motorcycle accident and all of that. And yes, I was thinking to myself, one, you know, one person, <laughs> who died right and uh because back then you know uh geez uh you know the number of people i know who have died even when i was young was you know a commercial airline tragedy figure you know and then i realized hearing her talk about it she was telling all the details about how he died and how people reacted and who went to the funeral and what they said and all of that and i'm listening to this going wow you know he got a death of his very own. His, uh, his was a singular death. I didn't get that in terms of the friends of ours because there was, everybody was doing it. There were so many people dying at the same time that, you know, memorials were sometimes stacked, you know, over the weekend. And um, this guy is, he had a singular tragedy, his death. And people will tell stories about him and they'll remember him and he'll remember his, his singular death. And, uh, and it made me realize, wow, you know, how, how nice for him, (laughs) you know, how nice for him that his, that his family and his parents could really take care of one another and focus on him and on that and on the loss of him, that person. And, uh, because we weren't afforded that, um, for a long time and now we kind of are you know now uh you know i life has turned to some form of normalcy i'm in my 60s so death among my friends uh my social circle is starting to accelerate (laughs) again it's nothing like it was in the 80s it's starting to it's starting to tick up a little bit i'll say well and uh, the big importance for me as a younger person i wouldn't say young necessarily they're now a lot of people that are younger than me these days. That's right. It's uh, all relative. Is is learning and um, through your words experiencing your wisdom and your experience, your experience. And okay, so there's this quote where you said, "Our heartbreaking past is important history that should be preserved. It is not a prevention strategy." Another quote: "Our influence as long-term survivors may be limited, but we can find meaning and engagement as cultural elders." and mentors. And it's one thing that our society, at least here in the U.S., in large part lacks, is valuing age and the wisdom and the experience that comes with age. We value youth disproportionately. And this idea of having and appreciating cultural elders and mentors is not a given. It's something that has to be taught. And we need to speak to the importance of that and insist on 
reintroducing that as a, as a part of a way of our life, not just as it relates to HIV AIDS. Well, and of course, this, this applies, first of all, to all of society, whether you're gay or straight or what have you, you know, but it is also true that um, in, in uh, the, the gay community that I belong to, that I came of age in, your, your uh, sexual attractiveness, number one, right? Very tip top of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, the list of things. And uh, thank goodness in the last, you know, 10 or 20 years, we've started to kind of welcome other type, body types, age types, started to give them cute little names, you know, like Ginger and uh, Daddy. And so I check off two boxes now right away. Um, and thank God for that. You know, uh, as long as we're not <clears throat> using those labels, you know, those kind of uh, shortcuts, the way we've branded people, um, as a way of excluding anybody. It's a way of including, you know, life is about addition, not subtraction. It's about addition. And so in a way, you know, the bears and the cubs and the puppies and the this and the that and the daddies and the, you know, um, if we found a way to celebrate different kinds, that's great because that all said, I sure hope that um, I will learn to value myself beyond whether or not I'm physically pretty, you know, um, or, or desirable, desirable, because we're telling you, we're getting to the end of that road. And I don't mean that to be funny. And I don't mean for you to say, oh, Mark, but you look great for your age. I don't mean any of that. I mean that I've had a good run. I was an adorable little twink. And then I became the circuit boy and the muscle gym bunny. You know, I've, I've, done all of the stages, well, the stages of gay community, okay, because I bought into that completely, and um, to my detriment, but nevertheless, I've kind of bought into how do I need to look, what do I need to do as I enter this new stage of my life, and now I need to look like this, and I, all of it, um, and I still do, because it's, it's just inherent in, in the way I was raised in this community. We are re- we're getting to the end of that road. There's only so much longer that I can turn up the uh, enhance your appearance button on Zoom, you know, or, or, or you use a filter, you know, and there's only so long that can go on. By the way, I've let my beard grow out. This usually I have my ginger dye because I am a ginger, but I would bring it back to my original. This is very gray, you know, and um, uh, the next time you see me, it won't, it'll be ginger again. You just caught me in between rinses, you know, uh, because I still, I still take those steps and I don't think there's anything wrong with that in particular. The question is, what are my intentions? Do I want to, until the last dog dies, do I want to hope that someone finds me desirable? Okay. First of all, I'm married. He thinks I'm terrific. So we got that. Okay. And, and so certainly if you're single and, and you're looking for a partner, I can understand, you know, you, you, you know, you know, Keep yourself, you know, the best you can. But even then, at what point do I say, okay, all right, you know what? I'm just, I'm, I'm wearing the stretch sweatpants. I'll be on the sofa and I'm good. You, you know, there's a Facebook page devoted to older ginger people and their admirers. I will post on it sometimes if I get a new picture and, I, and my beard looks really good and I look kind of redheaded. I will post on it sometimes just so guys will go, oh, woof, woof. What am I doing? What am I doing? You know, okay, that was a quick, quick jolt of immediate gratification. But what am I doing? I am going to be 63 in a couple of months. Will I be doing this when I'm 70? You know, at what point do I say, okay, all right, that's enough. I'm comfortable in my own skin. This is how I look. Take it or leave it because I have all these other things to offer. Well, and to continue on that, look, that's exactly the point how important is physical attraction really at the end of the day? And, and the whole point of bringing this up is that I hope we get to a point, especially now that demographically in the U S our older generation is just, is ballooning and the amount of young people we have is shrinking. So hopefully we can allocate a little bit of the resources of our attention Mm -hmm. to older folks and really understanding the inherent value there, which isn't connected to physical attraction. 
you know, and, and this, this is going to sound like, woe is me, I'm so pretty. This, just get ready, because that's how this is about to sound. <laughs> I feel as if I, I came of age and, and walked through most of my adulthood, AIDS aside and tragedy, and yeah, we're all, you know, there was that too. But I negotiated life as a very attractive strawberry blonde. And I walked into a room and people looked. And I got used to it. I just, I don't really think, and, I, and my friends would go, oh, Mark, they'd roll their eyes because people would, you know, want to come up to whatever, you know, that whole social scene where they could see who, you know, oh, Mark's getting cruised you know, in the bar, you know, whatever it was. And I just got used to it. And I, I, I just blithely swept through rooms with this sense of kind of, you know, hot privilege or something, whatever that was. And um, when I say to my detriment, I mean it. And that's where it sounds like I'm complaining because I was so pretty. I didn't develop uh, my friendships as closely as I might have because I was busy collecting chips, collecting, collecting looks, you know, making sure my arms looked really great in this certain position. You know, whatever it was, I was obsessed. And because and I, I saw what it gave me. And hey, look, I grew up as a gay boy in Louisiana who thought that I was going to hell and felt terrible about myself. And so then now I'm getting all of this attention because I'm pretty, I'll take it. I took it, you know? Uh, but then it became an obsession where that's all I thought about. And so all of the, you know, I'm your typical gay guy that only works out what shows in a tank top. That's it. If it is a show in my tank top, I don't work it out. That's it. So I wasn't there for health. I was there for narcissism. And I feel as if in the last, you know, I'm 63. I feel like as if in the last 20 years, I've had to play catch up in my personal relationships. I've had to build better relationships with my family, better relationships with the friends that I have who have either survived or stuck around and spend more time just, just paying attention to them and listening to them and not always looking over their shoulders to see who else is here that likes me you know i hope the right people are here are watching this and hearing this because i think there's a lot of people that can relate to that and and hopefully that will inspire some people to like reevaluate maybe their priorities as as they're getting older or even being young and and i now i have to put this delicately those friends i've had that didn't enjoy that sort of adoration who enriched themselves through meaningful careers and reading and the development of personal relationships with people, you know, those few friends that remained my friends with me, you know, you know uh, thank God. It's almost as if I got to a certain age and they went, well, welcome into the room, Mark. Oh, well, finally, you're going to pay attention to life and culture and friendships. Are you done being pretty? Are you done? Are you, can we move on? <laughs> and yes, I've moved on. Okay. You also mentioned in that essay, uh, feeling unwelcome as long-term survivors in the modern advocacy movement. Can you speak to that a little bit? What makes you feel that way? You know, it's funny. I wrote that piece about 10 years ago and much has been improved. We were kind of the afterthought because either you were focused on preventing new HIV infections, so everybody was focused on that, you know, among people who were negative, um, or uh, finding more and successful treatments for people who were positive. But for those of us who were aging, it's funny, we're like the guinea pigs. We are, we are the generation that started out where, you know, I was diagnosed in 85, there weren't, you know, treatments for 10 years. Wow, I wonder how long he'll live, let's see. And they studied us and, you know, and then, oh, these new drugs came out. How long will we live now? You know, we've always been examined in that way. And, and now they're like, okay, well, now Mark's 63 and he's been on these drugs for a while. I wonder how long until his, he gets osteoporosis or heart disease or these other things that tend to happen to older people with HIV. Let's find out. <laughs> You know, in other words, after all these years, we're still the guinea pigs, long-term survivors. We're still the ones being kind of examined closely. And um, I'm okay with that. I'm a lot better about it than I used to be. It's like, you know, and again, this is maturity. Okay, well, they're going to learn something about me and my the trajectory of the rest of my life that's going to help 
the people coming up. You know, I, I'm good with that. I've, I've, in speaking with long-term survivors, I, and folks hearing, seeing comments and, and DMs online, I've, I've noticed that there is a desire uh, and a need for hearing more of these stories and experiences such as yourself through the 80s uh, epidemic. But I've always kind of struggled a little bit and been a little bit timid and afraid of being perceived as exploiting the stories. Um, do you have any advice for that? Because I, I know that it's important and, and I should, but I also don't want to be that guy that's like, mm, tell me all your juicy <laughs> hardships. You know, it reminds me, I got a new therapist about, I don't, I don't know, I don't have him anymore, but I had, was, I, had, I had a first visit with a new therapist about five years ago. And as soon as he found out I was diagnosed, you know, 35 years earlier, he was like licking his chops. He was so excited. He wanted to hear all about it. Oh, tell me about the pain of that. I'm like, no, 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 no. You got the wrong guy. I'm good with that. I'm actually here to talk about, you know, my anxiety over what, or whatever the hell it was, you know. Um, yeah, people, it is the go-to story. If you know he's a long-term survivor, you're naturally interested. So I'm not offended by it. Um, uh, and, and if you're interested enough to want to tell our stories or hear it from somebody, I don't feel like that's exploitative at, at all. As long as you're treating them respectfully, like a whole person, you know, it's like, you don't want to objectify anybody for any particular characteristic and ignore all the rest. So go for it. Just be respectful. Okay. Good, good, succinct words. I appreciate that. Um, I actually have a, a lot. I have a lot of <laughs> more notes that I wanted to get to, but you and I can gab easily for so long. And I know you have a very tight schedule. So um, I propose maybe in a few months from now, um, after I've read the rest, so that we are not just covering HIV as well, we can do this Rafe, again. And is, maybe... Anytime you want, I enjoy these conversations very much. And it's exactly the sort of intergenerational stuff that we've both been talking about and how yeah. often this doesn't happen. Because I think the point I wanted to make earlier is it doesn't happen because there's always the sexual component of, oh, I'm a daddy and he's a whatever. In other words, we always want to oversimplify what it is, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to maybe we're just friends. Maybe this is yeah. that we could talk to each other in an intimate way without it being reduced to something else. You know, something yeah. is, as is, is lazy as sex. Right. So yeah. I enjoy these very much and let's do it again, whenever it works for you. I'm so happy you said that. And it, it reminded me of something that I thought about recently because when I was a uh, late teen and exploring my sexuality, I went, I've, re I discovered that there's a gay beach in Southern California in Laguna Beach and I would drive there as often as I could because I had no other gay experience mm -hmm. and I found when I went there there was all the really young hot sexy guys in their little like cool popular groups milling about on the beach and then there was also this big setup and they were always there same guys much older um up upwards of 80 years old um, and they would play volleyball and they all congregated together as well and I found that I was so much more comfortable with these older men and, and maybe on some level they did ogle me a little bit, but by and large, it was very respectful mm -hmm. and it was, they were very kind and friendly and accepting and, and mentored me in a way. And I felt so comfortable that I, I would come back every time and I would go and it wasn't about sex, but I, I found out later on when, as I met some of the, these younger folks that they all just assumed that I was just some like, sex slave to these, to uh -huh. these dudes and that I couldn't possibly have a meaningful friendship with these guys right. that were older than me. Yeah. Okay. So in, as I'm starting to wrap up here, I wanted to ask, uh, what are you hoping that people will walk away with after reading your book? Um, I, they will walk away with a sense of pleasure, a sense of satisfaction because so much of what they will have read includes them includes them and they will feel like wow that was my story too that was there's a part there that i really related to which i've been hearing by the way from oh i have a friend he's mormon and married and has many kids and he read the book and he's like oh my gosh this is so hilarious and this happened to me too in other words the best i can do is try to reveal with honesty about myself and hope that you you go oh yeah yeah i know that to be true 
uh, so much of life lessons are universal, and that's the universal uh, nature of, of writing, the kind of writing I, I like to do. So that's it. Just a sense of satisfaction. And then, oh, my gosh, this is so great. I need to buy copies for all my friends. Absolutely. Are there any future works in, in, in mind? I'm going to keep doing books? exactly what I'm doing. I, I, I just posted on my fabulous disease yesterday. I will continue doing that. I love it as an outlet. I love being able to write something and just press a button and bang, you, want, you read it. I'm so immediate gratification. It killed me to write a book and have to wait and wait for it to come out. Okay, and then from our last video, I do I did have, um, well, it was a couple people that asked a similar question, which is they wanted to know, credit to you, what is your daily routine? Because you look so healthy and so strong for your age. Uh, well, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I did a big photo shoot for a magazine about three months ago, and prior to it, I trained for it like an Olympic event. I was training every day. I was working my ass off. I have, have not been back to the gym since the day of that photo shoot. <laughs> and A, it's because my back started going going out. And um, um, I, I, I don't know. Now I feel like the guy that doesn't look like his photos. Um, but to answer your question, I think a lot of it is positive mental attitude. You know, I, I think that you're more attractive when you smile. Oh, that sounds like I'm telling people to smile. What I'm saying is for me, I'm happy to be here and I have a sense of happiness and purpose. And I think that's what they're seeing. Otherwise, my routine is regular household stuff and feed the cats and get to the grocery store. And um, now that I'm in physical therapy for my back, as soon as I get that worked out, I will be back to the gym too. Maybe I'll work on my core. I hear there's this thing called your core, Rafe. This might be important for you to know. There's a core that helps you bend over and pick up things when you get old. And you need to work on it's that. It's one of those things you can't see while wearing a tank top. That's right. That's right. Well, it turns out that at physical therapy, they're telling me I need to work on my core. And you're right. You can't see it. So I hate that. But I'll, I, I will work on it. So that's my, <laughs> my normal day is very mundane. I promise you. Other than, you know, the cats and the husband and the snuggling. Okay. Is there anything we haven't discussed today that you'd like to talk about? Not at all. I look forward to talking to you again, Rafe. I really appreciate it. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you so much for agreeing to sit down with me to discuss your book release. I will have links to your website, to your blog, to your link tree, your Twitter, your Instagram, Facebook, all the things in the description box below. So anybody can find those there. Everyone at home, please comment below your thoughts, comments, and questions. Do not miss checking out Mark's book. Do not miss it. The digital version is only $5.99. That is a steal. That is so awesome. Otherwise, you can get it in paperback for $19.99. Mark, thank you again. Everyone at home, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. And share this video with people who in your life who might find this information to be valuable. If you care to donate in support of this channel, you can send me a super thanks below. As some of you have done, thank you so much. Or there's a new PayPal link as well. Until next time, cheers.